like, okay, you know how in the mysteries they always say, who done it? Well, this is a what done it. The Great Depression mystery. Obviously, um, this was designed as a, well, not obviously, this was designed as a classroom um, activity, but of course, we're not in a classroom, so you're just going to have to imagine um, what is happening as we go through the slideshow. So, the Great Depression in America. The American economy went from unprecedented prosperity in the 1920s to unprecedented misery in the 1930s. What happened? That's what we're going to try to figure out today. So, U.S. prosperity in the 1920s was, to a large extent, based on the sale of houses and automobiles. If you've done your 1920s statistics assignment, um, you will see the increase in the purchases of those things. It's the multiplier effect, right? Everybody had jobs, so everybody bought things which created more jobs. But it was both based on houses and automobiles. And you don't buy these outright with cash. You buy them with uh, loans and installment plans, right? And so there was an increase in the amount of debt that people and businesses were carrying. Um, obviously it created jobs for workers who built homes, cars, furniture, and appliances. It also created roads and electric plants and sewage and water facilities um, because those were built to support infrastructure and growth. And of course, this construction also created jobs. So we were in a, um, a, a boon, an economic boon. So all this prosperity allowed workers to spend money and they provided income to other workers, thus allowing them to spend money, which provided income to other workers and etc. It's again called the multiplier effect. One person spending becomes income to another person who can then spend more and add more to the income of others. This is important in all economies. We're seeing the reverse multiplier effect with the coronavirus in China um, because people are staying home and not spending money, and so businesses are not um, able to survive and stay open. So in the late 1920s, the multiplier effect began to work in reverse. Business activity slowed down, the economy entered a recession, sales of homes and automobiles began to fall, so factories and businesses slowed production, and all of this caused layoffs. So imagine that I had given you each an occupation card, okay? So machine producing industry, if you had that, you would stand up, so one of you would stand up. Um, you are now unemployed. Businesses are ordering less machinery, so you are out of a job. If you were in car sales, stand up. You are now unemployed. Car dealers who employ you let you go because sales of new cars are down. We're doing the reverse multiplier effect here. Auto workers, what do you think is going to happen? You're now unemployed. New car production has slowed because sales are too low. Who's next? Steel workers. If we're not making any cars, we don't need steel, so you don't have a job. And all of you standing now, <clears throat> you don't have jobs, so you're not spending money. So it's going to multiply to all of you sitting down. Housing construction, you're out of a job because people aren't buying new houses because they don't have new money. <clears throat> so you don't have a job building houses because houses aren't being built. Furniture sales, furniture factory, you're now unemployed. There are no new houses. So many people out of work. Nobody's buying furniture. Those of you still sitting, what are your jobs, right? Your jobs are now in danger. Restaurant workers. Unemployed people still eat, but they don't um, go out to eat. That's a luxury that nobody really does. Grocery stores even. I mean, people need to eat, but they're not buying as much. You're unemployed too. They're only buying the basics. And those basics have lower profits um, for grocery stores than the higher end luxury goods. So stores are eliminating employees. Clothing store workers, yep, you don't have a job either. Because people are so short of money, they're not buying new clothes. They're making the old clothes they have last. They're patching, they're sewing. Um, and they're making clothes out of things like flour sacks. So if all of you standing, which should be the whole room by now, um, start buying products again, unemployment will fall, but you guys don't have money to buy products again, so we are stuck in this mess. So if people buy new automobiles, car dealers will place new orders, they will hire workers, auto workers and producers of materials for the auto industry will be re-employed, right? So auto workers and steel workers and car people sit down. Let's assume we're buying things again. So you guys have jobs again. Thank goodness. <clears throat> furniture starts to wear out. People need new furniture. So if you all buy new furniture, the furniture makers and furniture salespeople can sit down. And so now that you all are employed again, all of you sitting, you can afford to buy a house. So housing construction workers, you sit down. 
With new prosperity, luxury items are being bought at the grocery store again. People are eating at restaurants again, and people are buying new clothes again. So all grocery store workers, restaurant workers, and clothing workers, you guys sit down. So we're now multiplying back forward into economic prosperity again. Business firms are expanding production, so they need new machinery and equipment. So machinery workers, you now have a job again. So this is the business cycle, <coughs> right? We have a peak, and there's usually a recession and a giant trough. That's what the Great Depression was, and then a recovery, and then a peak again. And so <clears throat> in the trough and the recession, um, demand for goods falls um, because nobody has money to buy goods. And then as it recovers, demand for goods rises again, and then demand for goods creates jobs. Yes? So we often talk about the great stock market crash of 1929 creating the Great Depression, but it wasn't the only thing, maybe. I think it contributed because it caused panic. People felt poorer, so they curbed their purchasing. If you feel like you don't have any money, even if you have money, you're not going to buy anything. There's great stories about fantastically wealthy people. When they die, they leave millions to libraries and and opera houses, and nobody knew they were rich because they lived very simply because they always felt like they didn't have money. My grandma lived through the Great Depression. She was in her 20s, um, and she hoarded money like crazy um, because she always thought that it could disappear. And so she had plenty of money, but didn't live like it. So the stock market, actually, that crash made a lot of people richer. Not normal people, not regular Joe Schmoes, but fabulously wealthy people were, were um, enriched by the fall in the stock market because once it fell, they bought low, and then as it recovered again, they sold high. But what happened to the banks? So it could have been the bank foreclosures that caused the Great Depression. So if we're looking at 1920, 168 banks closed. But in 1929, 659. In 1930, 1,352. In 1931, 2,294. In 1932, 1,456. In 1933, 4,000 banks closed, right? What happens if your bank closed? This is not just like a branch of your bank, like the China Construction branch that's underneath my um, apartment building. The entire bank, China Construction, closes. What happens to my money? It disappears, right? So as banks closed, it took money out of the economy. When banks fail, depositors lose their money, so they have no money in their accounts. Everything disappears and it disappears from the economy. It's gone, right? Because it's not real cash money. It's not actually sitting in a bank somewhere. It's figurative. So the banks close and say it's gone, and then it's actually gone. It disappears. It's a magic trick, right? So then there's less money circulating in the economy, and when there's less money, fewer goods and services are purchased, and fewer workers are employed, like that reverse multiplier effect that we um, talked through at the beginning of this PowerPoint. So look at the money in circulation. It, it um, goes down from 26 to 19 over four years, right? So we don't have any money, and we don't have any jobs, and the stock market has crashed, okay? So the Federal Reserve Act of 1913 <clears throat> required that regional Federal Reserve banks were supposed to lend money to local banks who were in trouble, right? And this is true. If I walked into my China construction bank and demanded all of my money, and I had a lot of money in my account, they might not have that kind of cash on hand uh, because banks don't really keep that much cash. So they would have to get it from somewhere else. So it would take a couple of days. But if the banks couldn't get it from somewhere else, if they were a, a, a standalone bank, they didn't actually have cash reserves, right? They, they uh, the, the way banks work is they take your money and then they use the, the money to invest so that they can make money off of your money. So your money physically isn't actually there. Right? So if I come in and demand the money that it's not there, then it, that they're in trouble. So the Federal Reserve Act was supposed to allow those banks to appeal to the central government, to the federal government, um, to lend the money to local banks um, who were in trouble. So I'm a local bank. You come in, you demand your money. I don't have it. The Federal Reserve is supposed to help me out. They're the lenders of last resort. <clears throat> but it was very political, and the Fed would not lend money to banks who were struggling. They actually lended, uh, lent money um, to their friends and their cronies. It was a big cronyism thing. So the Fed kind of stood by as banks collapsed and they didn't do anything. So what happens when a bank collapses? People panic. So here we are with the questions. and This is your assignment for today. What would you have done? So you're going to think through this based on what we've just talked about. When I say we've talked about, 
what I have talked at you about. So imagine that you are an American citizen with a bank account. You read the newspapers. You see the banks are collapsing in other countries and the rate of bank failures in the United States has risen. What would you do and why? Okay, that's your first question, so think through that. Then your second question is imagine you are an American citizen with a bank account still. You read in the newspaper that the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, it's the RFC, a U.S. Congress-created recovery program that lends businesses that are in trouble, including banks, money to stay afloat. So you read that the RFC is financing the bank where you have your money, right? And because the RFC is financing it, that means it's in trouble. So the bank that has your money is in trouble. What are you likely to do and why? Okay. And then finally, did your answers to both of these questions mean you contributed to the Great Depression? Tell me if you helped the Great Depression happen. If you took your money out, if you didn't take your money out. Based on that, did you help start the Great Depression? Because we're thinking again of multiplier effects, right? If you do it and you're the only one that does it, it doesn't make a difference. But if everybody's doing one or the other, it makes a difference. And then your final question for the day is summarize your opinion on what caused the Great Depression. Yes? Be well. Stay safe.